Hello there again, Golden Bear family. We are now to our last uh, two sections, 6.9 and 6.10 of this module six. And with that, I'd like to just jump right in. Uh, the Gilded Age ideologies, uh, the belief systems, uh, things that shaped America during this time of great industrial revolution. And so um, with that, one of these key ideas that seems to emerge chronically during this rise of industrialization is that is also the rise of immigration. With the rise of immigration, we have collision points happening between the immigrants and the natives who are here, uh, you know, allegedly here and declaring themselves uh, the leaders of, of America and its freedom. And so here you see New England writing this idea of, oh, liberty, white goddess. Is it well to leave the gates unguarded? This is meant to champion a, a converse mindset of what is put at the bottom of the statue of giving you weary and heavy laden. Um, this is just a direct uh, confluence and a contradictory statement that, that we're going to try and unpack. How did this statement come to be part of the American psyche? Psycho, psyche? How did this become part of the ideology and the belief systems? Well, we have to look at a few things uh, in, this, in this chapter to kind of unpack where this emerged. So as usual, I'd like to start with a story uh, before we dive in to kind of help create some sense of meaning and also some sense of warpness uh, that I, uh, you know, have as a person, as, as a teacher. Um, as you all know, I grew up in H-Town and um, in kindergarten, I came across a, a, a new guy who a young man, same age as I, obviously, that he enjoyed doing some of the same things, riding the tricycle around, playing in the sandbox, uh, you know, going on the swing sets, etc. And he and I, his name was Jeff, got to be pretty good chums. And, um, you know, uh, one day I said, hey, uh, what are you doing this weekend? Maybe I can come over and play on Saturday. And so I got the telephone number from his, of his, of his home and I gave it to my mom. Uh, my mom reached out to his mom. And, uh, you know, when she hung up, she goes, well, my mother says this, we'll be having none of that in our home. And I didn't even know what she meant by this. And, and so I come to find out uh, one day after school, he uh, invited me um, over to his, his place. And so we walked from elementary school, which was probably a mile in the opposite direction of where my house was. And dude, he, he lived at the house that I'd only seen from the car. I'm like, what, he has a tennis court? This is the dude. They literally had, uh, they owned their own mountain. Seriously, there was a whole section of him that that was cut out, uh, tiered, uh, that they grew kind of at one time potatoes on it. But since then, they have turned it into the Himmets Zoo. And, and so this family, literally, there were buffalo there, there were giraffe there, there were African zebras, etc. And I'm like, dude, you live here at this house? Yeah. I go, oh, I didn't know. So, you know, I played for a few hours at his place and we were having fun and his mom came out and asked who I was and I shared who I was. She goes, oh, okay, and went back inside. Next thing we know, and about a half hour later, my mom is there to pick me up in the car. I'm like, hey mom, what's up? And she goes, hmm, I thought we settled this already uh, a few months past. I go, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, we, we just don't think you need to be over there uh, at, at this person's house. Oh, okay. Well, what I didn't come to find no at that age is that, you know, I was of a poor family that was barely making it. And this was one of the wealthiest families, not only in Hemet, but it was their family that sold all of the potatoes that McDonald's was using at that place in the entire United States. Isn't that crazy? They had farms all over Idaho, farms over Utah, farms of over Southern California. So every French fry that McDonald's was using went through this family and um you know uh, there's more to this story and, and essentially uh, this guy uh, goes on and makes some poor choices was thrown into jail uh, died in jail a sad sad story that yours truly blue collar boy uh made it through and those that had a lot more than we certainly did certainly did not and, and so why do i tell this story to you is that uh, I, I i had a collision point early on I didn't know the idea between the wealthy and then the poor but by the time I got to middle school I began to understand that oh this is what that means and then when I got to high school oh this is what it really meant and so uh, just as uh, you know Jeff had to encounter being 
be schniz on campus uh, for whoever he thought. The rest of us made it a point to really try to, uh, mm, hate to say this, but yeah, we kind of picked him on, picked on him and avoided him and, and I'm sure made him feel very uncomfortable because of his money. And so, um, you know, th there's a lot of regrets on my part and others, but I just want to let you know that America has had this struggle of wealth versus uh, the poor uh, since its beginning and, and it still continues to this day. And so in this module, we're going to unpack about what this wealth ideology meant, where it came from and, and kind of how it looks. So here we're going to look at bullet number one is how there were doctrines of this time that justified the existence of wealth uh, and Carnegie and Smith will talk briefly about them and, and how they felt these were appropriate measures. And then also there were critiques of those who said wealth in the, uh, the, the, in, in the hands of just a few is wrong and is, is horrible for the end uh, justifying the means in American history. And so uh, you're seeing a word sheet here that will do uh, both comparing and contrasting the gospel of wealth versus that of social Darwinism. Uh, you'll be doing that on your own and, and maybe we'll discuss a little of that when we're in class uh, together. So uh, number one, doctrines of success. Uh, with this great industrial power that is emerging across the landscape of America as we're at the cusp of 1870s and 1880s and 1890s. And more and more immigrants coming here, making it easier to keep industrializing because with more labor gives us ability to expand. Um, this, this hard work ethic and this opportunity to make it for yourself really began to influence every immigrant that came over. And this success kind of bred continued uh, ide ideology that if you came over to America, you too can strike it rich, much like Carnegie did, uh, Leland Stanford had done, um, who uh, Rockefeller had done, all these big names, they basically said, hey, you pick yourself up by your bootstraps, you too can have uh, that great American story of success through hard work. Well, what they didn't tell you on point bulletin two there is that often these wealthy businessmen <clears throat> succeeded simply because they had created trust. And if you remember uh, quite a few lectures back, we talked about vertical integration and horizontal integration and the ability to control the entire aspects of, of the production, the means of production it's called. But you also need to recognize that they developed systems where the government couldn't speak into telling them what to do. And these trusts were developed to reduce competition. And this competition enabled them to accumulate more and more wealth who suffered often the workers did, and often the government had no power in order to speak up against this. Adam Smith uh, wrote, you know, a, a really uh, powerful uh, book that also had this, this doctrine that basically said government is best if they have their hands off of this and allow the capitalistic invisible hand to work on its own. What is the invisible hand? Well, there's workers and there's purchasers and these two things will work to find a balance as to, uh, you know, if a product causes, costs this, uh, if there's not enough people willing to buy it, it will cause the price to go down. That's the invisible hand of capitalism and that will keep things in the check. Well, that makes sense as long as there aren't trusts and other things protecting um, this type of mechanism, which Adam Smith did not talk about. So we need to recognize that um, this invisible hand uh, in a perfect economy of capitalism might work, but the government was not abiding by that because they were protecting various corporations over other corporations during that time. Well, we have this belief system that Herbert Spencer, you've probably uh, maybe have never heard of that name before, but you've certainly heard of Charles Darwin. And mistakenly, often many people give Charles Darwin this idea of survival of the fittest as credit when it comes to history and the sociological study of, of, of man or woman, okay? But that isn't the case. It was Herbert Spencer who came up with this idea of the survival of the fittest. And it is that mindset that infuses the economic uh, processes uh, of, of the American uh, system. Meaning, if you were born poor, that doesn't matter. If you, if you are the strongest and you survive, then you have every right to uh, keep what you've managed to make. And so this uh, is fused with Charles Darwin, Darwin's Orwin, uh, Origins of the Species that kind of began um, validating that there is a progress of, of humanity. 
that is going to be supported in this type of methodology. There also during this time is this gospel of wealth that the churches are beginning to espouse uh, during this time period. One of them comes out of uh, Chicago with D.L. Moody, uh, namely one of them, where they basically said that the rich are kind of bestowed by God himself to with this lavish wealth. And it's this wealth that they're supposed to be a good steward with. And they're supposed to use this wealth as a way to bring a benefit towards the community in which they have been bestowed. So like the caretakers, if you will. And so you had Rockefeller, Carnegie, Stanford. Uh, not only did these men, uh, Crocker, uh, I can't think of all of their names right now, but they went on and, and, and started various colleges. They went on and funded um, huge philanthropic things uh, from libraries to schools, uh, etc. Um, Carnegie, for instance, um, he gave away almost all of his wealth uh, to the Carnegie Foundation. And in 1911, there's 145 million dollars he gave. Okay, in today's terms, in 2020, that would have been equivalent of 3.5 billion dollars. Um, a huge amount of money he gave away. What was it used for? And it is still used today. In fact, you can apply for Carnegie scholarships. Um, you've heard of Carnegie Hall and, and other things that they, they use. So these um, monies back from eight, you know, 100 plus years ago are still being used to fund scholarships uh, for the arts as of today. Well, there were challenges to this idea that was going on. And, and one of them was done by Frank Ward, where he, he basically says that Societies only can progress if the government gets involved and directly intervenes to help citizens. He was the first to articulate that basically government can do good when it's led by officials who aren't corrupt or who aren't corruptible. And if, if, if it is led by um, kind-hearted, uh, generous people, um, then government could do a general good rather than general harm. The ir irony of this is, is that our, the people of America during this time, ha they have not experienced a government that's done really good for them. I mean, remember, Andrew Johnson was impeached after the Civil War uh, for attempting to do good. And what has happened since then? We're going to see almost a 30 years of, of a government that is, uh, we're going to allow businesses to do what they want, when they want, why they want goes all the way up until essentially 1932, I believe it is, uh, at the end of the, the Great Crash of 1929 when FDR uh, comes into power. There's some other group that Henry George and, and Edward Bellamy come to argue with a uh, state that money in the hands of a few industrialists was unfavorable and actually detrimental and harmful. And they argue that this trickle-down theory, they say, well, we know best mean uh, the wealthy know what best of how to spend the money to it'll get down to the hands of the poor working class uh, no they say that isn't how it should be done in fact there should be a different tax system to where everybody is taxed equally and the wealthy should be taxed even more and so this graduated tax we'll talk a little bit later on here in the lecture uh, received a lot of deaf ears but eventually america did go to that uh, under the fdr administration it just took another 30 more years before we came to recognition of that. And then lastly, Karl Marx, maybe in your AP Euro class, I'm sure Mr. Uh, Hamill uh, had talked about uh, the Russian Revolution and, and Karl Marx and, and, and Max uh, Weber and Engels and these uh, German uh, Hegelian thinkers and what they were trying to recognize of, that there needs to be a, a, a revolution of the working class to topple the wealthy. Uh, in order to create more of an egalitarian society. And if in your English class you read Animal Farm, hopefully you have a little sense of what that is that traces eventually the, the, the rise and then the, the summit to fall uh, of uh, communism, um, at least known under by the time we get to Stalin of sorts. Um, so you need to recognize um, that there's gonna be some key people during this time period that will be speaking about this gospels of success and the failures of them. And one of them is Jacob Reese. I'll be talking about those with my Steger Select, uh, but also Thomas Nast. And, and, and this is his, some of his artwork where the government is doing everything it could 
and can to make sure that the wealthy industrialists are keeping themselves in power. So to summarize, um, what we need to recognize is that we see the one static thing during this time period is that our government was working really, really hard at supporting everything the industrial complex needed in order to thrive and to survive and to create a systems that, that will not impede their growth. And so you find the, the government, federal government was doing everything it could to restrain itself, hoping that this would keep uh, the growth taking place across the American landscape. So that takes us to the final part of this politics and protests um, here. And I love this quote by Henry George. It, it speaks and resonates to maybe many of you who, who come from a poor background or one that knows what it's like to struggle with. And here's the quote. It says, our boasted freedom necessarily involves slavery. So long as we recognize private property in land, until that is abolished, the Declaration of Independence and Acts of Man's Emancipation are in vain. He goes on, Henry George, and he basically um, writes a book that was received not on deaf ears, but on ears who thought this they were intolerable, the wealthy elite industrialists of, of the East Coast. And they worked really hard to keep this book from coming into print. Eventually, it did come into print, and almost three million copies of this was sold. And this Henry George's ideas of progress of poverty went on to influence this political party that we'll talk about here soon, and in, in, in how um, we need to find ways to create greater equality amongst Americans and find a way to eliminate the one percent that have you know ninety percent or more of the land or the wealth or the institutional knowledge or the institutional ownership of things and distribute this more equally across Americans. So we find that America is going to begin pushing that envelope uh, here uh, during this, this time period. And what's going to trigger it are going to be some depressions that happen both in 1873 and 1893. And it's these, these depressions that allow it to be a fermented, like a, I guess, a bed, if you will, a fertile soil for seeds of dissent to emerge and kind of begin uh, blaming our government for some of these problems. As usual, I love to start with the story uh, of this. Um, when my family moved to H-Town in, in 1969, it was, I was barely a year old. And we moved there for various factors, but uh, my father uh, was a stockbroker. And uh, he moved there, uh, paid really well. We got to choose a neighborhood that uh, was kind of a nice neighborhood. And this is only stories after the fact. And so our first four or five years of living in H-Town, I guess my parents were on the inside track, had the country club lifestyle and all this other stuff. And then all of a sudden, 1973 hits and, and the, the stock market crashes. What happens? My dad loses his job. And for the next year and a half, there were three of us in the family, three you know, the other brothers and sisters, that my parents told us later on that um, my dad didn't have work for over a year and a half. He took every possible odd and end job he could do. I can remember uh, one time he loaded my brother and I up. Uh, my sister had been born in 72, so she was still too young to travel, so I think my sister and mom stayed home. My dad um, was willing to do anything. Uh, in in H-Town, there were was a bunch of manufacturing of uh, motor coaches of you know uh, like used to be him it was like the epicenter for um rvs i think there were like six or seven rv manufacturers in him and so um my dad uh hired out his services to drive rvs if a customer had bought it up in wairika he'd be the one to drive it up there and somehow maybe rent a car and then come back with it so one such trip i can remember my dad loading my brother and I on a long road trip up in this thing. We thought it was the coolest thing and, and having to come home in this small little Volkswagen. But, you know, we didn't know why my dad was doing this. This was just him as a way to provide for the family. It was during that time that my dad started a cleaning business and, and he worked usually every night cleaning offices. Here he was, a stockbroker. Now he's cleaning the same offices that he went back to and said, would you be willing to hire me at least to clean your place? talk about humility and, and so that's where we were as janitor family for quite a few years uh, because of the stock market crash and how it affected us. I, I remember uh, during this time as well 
that the economy was so bad that we would have to have, I remember uh, waiting in, in gas lines uh, for hours in order to get wine. I remember that there was rationing of types of foods, etc. Uh, I can remember my mom saying, no, honey, we can't get that uh, this week. We don't have the money for that. I can actually remember, oh, it so grossed me out. For some reason, my mom tried to tell us that this meat that she was serving us with our uh, hamburger helper, if you will, was just like hamburger. Um, come to find when I took my first bite, it was too cheap. I go, this isn't hamburger. I go, what is this? She goes, well, I can't lie to you. It's, it's cow tongue. Oh my God, cow tongue. How could, could you? So that just tells you kind of the experience uh, of what my parents were going through. And so this was, um, you know, a, a stark uh, uh, time for our family. But this was very similar to what it was like during this time period here in America. In, in the, the various crashes that happened and in this time period of 1873 and 1893, when those crashes happen, it causes major changes and disruptions uh, to, to major people groups. So here you can see, we see as a result of the crashes, political parties are gonna go through some fundamental shifts. The second bullet there, you're gonna begin seeing farmers begin to become activists and ask for change. And you're gonna begin seeing the economy and, and how this uh, changes as well. So point number one, you have a weak presidency that, that and, and a Congress that is incapable of handling this. Why? Because they're typically seen as corrupt. Uh, you, you can, you know, you know, please be mindful that at the end of the Civil War, you know, President Lincoln passes on. You have Andrew Johnson, who is practically impeached. And from that point forward, you begin seeing the office of the president becoming weaker and weaker and weaker. In fact, we don't even see a strong president and the capacity of, of the executive power take place until we get to FDR. And that's because the American people are finally weary of, of, uh, of <coughs> a, a weak president that's not doing anything. And so who runs things? Well, the business leaders run things, and guess what the business leaders do? They're the ones that tell the legislatures who can kind of run and can't run and who's going to help them get reelected, etc. And so they have sway over legislators and judges. That's not a, a, a good time if you're on the outside circle, if you will. And during this time, you see the farmers are going to be experiencing some, some things. And, and so as I go through this, I'm going to be reading some quotes uh, about how farmers are affected by this and, and, and again we see another stock market kind of being triggered uh, during this time I love this this there's a quote here from this uh, little song that is, is is talked about during this time and it's uh, a contemporary farm protest song uh, from Kansas and it says the bankers followed us out west and did in mortgages invest they looked ahead and shrewdly planned and soon they'll have our Kansas land this is the essence of what the farmers are going to be beginning to experience when this 1893 uh, stock market crash, it, it goes, it's going to create major uh, problems for them. Now, what is the essence of what, what is the issue at hand? Okay. Uh, and growing up um, just around the house from us were a bunch of orange groves. And if you've been listening to some of our stories, you know, some of the orange groves were very sweet and memorable to me. Well, one such orchard, uh, was owned by the DeMoss family and I was friends with Max and um, he would sometimes invite me over uh, during harvest season and for these particular oranges I think they were Valencia oranges so Valencia and naval oranges here to be a little geeky for you they have two different seasons Valencia if I'm not mistaken is during the December months and and uh, naval is during the summer months and, and they did that intentionally so that way they'll always have harvest of different oranges to sell across the globe well during Christmas season, um, my friend Max would say, hey, Doug, you want to come over and help me put together a bunch of bundles of oranges and then we can sell them on the street? And I said, dang, let's do that. Heck yeah, I want some Christmas candy money. And so I'd go over there and, and we'd put together big five pound bags. I'll bet you we'd probably make 15 to 20 of them each. And then we would put them in our uh, wheelbarrow that he had there. And then we would put them out on a table. And there it was, suggested donation of like two bucks or three bucks. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Why aren't we staying here? He goes, oh no, if we were to sit here all day long as people drive by, um, we'll be sitting here all day long. What we do is we just kind of leave a basket here and people come by and they pay us. I go, are you kidding me? People just show up, they take it back and they leave money? Yeah, they leave money right there in the can. I go, that's kind of cool. 
So I go, why don't we hide up in the tree? Because I don't trust people. This doesn't make sense. So we get up in the tree and sure enough, a car drives by, shows up, goes in, opens a little can, puts the money in there, takes a bag and leaves. I'm like, dude, that is the coolest thing. This honor system in oranges gave me a good sense of confidence that people were good in the world. But can you imagine in today's day, I wonder what would take place. I don't know if people would honor such a system like that. But imagine that's how the political system was running back then. Everybody kind of trusted the politics as usual to take place, to trust the president to do the right thing, to trusted Congress to do the right thing. And what was ha happening essentially is there were a few groups of people who basically weren't paying for the oranges they were taking. And this is the result of Congress of trying to kind of weaken itself and pay the bill for everybody else. Congress, as you know, had the right to print money and to pass laws, and as they had the right to print money and spend those money, they were doing that gladly. Case in point, they, during this time period, because of the spoil systems of giving their best friends the jobs, even though they didn't meet the merit of those jobs, um, they were closer with corporations pretty quickly. By the 1890s, um, they passed the first billion dollar Congress. That means that they were spending more money than they were bringing in for the first time ever since the War of 1812. This is a crazy amount of thing that they were doing. And so with this many special projects going on to enrich their constituents and themselves, this, this spoil system and this business as usual system really made it um, a struggle for America to bounce back when the whole system came to a crash, which was known as the you know, 1893 uh, crisis. And this crisis is going to affect not just, you know, the, the city people, those on the East Coast in the manufacturing, but it's going to affect who we'll talk about here shortly. That would be of uh, the farmers. Who are the farmers then? They're going to begin uniting because they're recognizing that they were sold a bill of goods. Listen to this uh, other quote that we have of the of the farmers and how the deflation of the value of their crop, namely wheat, um, is going down. Here's a quote. It says, 50 miles to water, 100 miles to wood. The hell with this damn country. I'm going home for good. Remember the whole uh, Homestead Act that was meant to give them opportunities uh, at, the civil, at the end of the Civil War. It has become a major catastrophe. They come out west, they, they start their farm, they begin taking out loans to grow the wheat that they thought would work. Well, what they didn't know is Argentine, Argentina, Argentina, um, Argent, um, Argentina Russia, um, were going to become one of the major exporters as well of, of wheat during this time. And so the farmers just went to one crop. When they go to one crop, they recognize they have a greater competition against the globe. And, and this creates further and further problems for them because they already took a loan to play for, pay for the land and the seed and their equipment. And now in order to do that, they have to keep growing more and more, <coughs> which means they need more of a loan. And you can see the cycle creating this crisis that they couldn't um, you know, take care of themselves uh, during this time. And so this is where we're going to see some farmers begin trying to say, how do we counteract this? And the first person begin taking a page out of the book of the farmers, like Samuel Gompers and what the, the working class were doing out of the factories, is this, this Oliver Kelly. He founded a secret society where they actually had passwords. They had uh, men and women of, they had four different levels of as they go through of trust and learning these rituals. Of, and, and they had different dress and how they did this. Uh, they called themselves ultimately like the Grangers. And these Grangers began to come together because they had one common recognition is that they themselves were the centerpiece to the entire American culture. Yet if they were the centerpiece of every industry that you see there on that artwork, if, if they were the centerpiece that without their food, everything else would have come to a standstill, um, then why are they in so much pain and turmoil? Why is the government doing very nothing, very little to, in fact, nothing to help them out of this crisis? And so by forming these farm cooperatives, they began having opportunity of, instead of working against each other, they collaborated and says, you know what? Let's all agree to charge this amount of much money per bushel. Because if we all agree to this power, 
uh, a price, I'm sorry, we can actually make more money and then repay the things. We can work together instead of each of us having to buy a tractor. What if we each shared a tractor or materials or goods and services? And so this um, really gave them an advantage by collectively working together rather than working against. And the second thing they did is they began challenging government to begin passing the ICC laws that regulated railroads because up to this point, the railroads were able to charge whatever they wanted to the farmers. They can say, hey, it would cost to send, um, let's say, horseshoes from Pittsburgh to Kansas, a certain fee to get those there, but to get the um, wheat from Kansas <coughs> to Pittsburgh, was triple the cost. And like, wait a minute, why is it triple the cost? Well, just because. So the ICC established regulated prices that enabled farmers to have a com competitive edge in, in, in knowing what things would cost before they were actually shipped off. And this is a, a good type of, uh, of thing uh, going on uh, in this time. You'll still find these cooperatives. Like if you saw a little sidebar, if you were to go uh, into the store and look for the label Sunkist, there at the top right of the screen, you'll see that was one of the first in California that was started by various citrus growers. Uh, and I knew quite a few citrus growers in our little valley there that were part of that. And uh, it was, uh, I didn't know to understand the value of it early on growing up, but I, I certainly see the value of how that provided for them and livelihood for their different families. Well, the Grangers um, grew in strength, but when they began gaining some um, economic stability and then the ICC were passed and they began working together in Granger movements, they began to recognize that they didn't need to necessarily focus on, on politics as much, uh, but they did focus on their economic alliances. And so this is where we begin seeing the Southern Alliance begin um, working uh, to their benefit. Now you say, why the Southern Alliance? Remember. After 1877, in the end of the whole Reconstruction failure, you have most of Congress being controlled by the South. How is that possible? Well, remember, because of the, um, uh, the, the poll taxes that were being done against the African American uh, and, and the generational stuff that was going on there uh, and the black codes, etc. Um, those things prevented uh, the African American from participating in, in, the, in the edge elective system. Who came into power then were the southern farmers. What did they do? They began having the government pass things in order for them. It was called the sub-treasury. Not a major thing for you to recognize, but you knew to recognize that it was tilted to the benefit of those in the south who have cotton. Why? Because cotton was non-perishable and not those in elsewhere like in California where they were growing apples or grapes where those things certainly were not perishable. They would, you know, had a time limit for them. <coughs> Another thing that the farmers wanted was this idea of getting more money in the um, circulation. Um, why is that important? During this time period around 1882, it was typically, it was said that there's about, in 1882, there's about $14.92 of coin and printed money that was available for every American at that time. By the time 10 years later, um, only $19 was available. The problem is, 10 years later, we had more and more wealth being accumulated in fewer and fewer hands. This meant that only the bankers and only the wealthy elites and industrialists had all the money tied up and that made it very difficult for banks um, in the farms areas or banks in the Midwest or banks out West to be able to give out loans. And this created a problem. And so many of the farmers began uniting and they says, wait a minute, what if we began printing silver? And, and this, this silver uh, at, at the rate of 16 to one. Now gold, it was really worth 32 to one. And so by them saying 16 to one, they were basically taking half the value of all the gold off the table. Um, the gold was basically owned by all the rich industrialists and the silver was predominantly a big thing for the farmers. This is an opportunity to add with, by adding silver into the economy would enable farmers to avoid high interest, and uh, enable them to begin taking money out in order to keep their businesses afloat. A very interesting um, presupposition that had grew in strength. How did it grow in strength? It grew in strength because of this thing called the People's Party or the Populists. 
And here you see, I love this balloon because it's it's an amalgam of different groups coming together. Uh, the Knights of the Labor Party, the Free Silver Party, the Socialists. It's, it's like a hodgepodge of, of a soup, so to speak, where they came together to become, what, see where the arrow is? It says a platform of lunacy. <laughs> what was the lunacy? The lunacy was that silver should be introduced into the economy and, and they're like the rich industrial like if no way if that ever happens half of my wealth is gone overnight and so they pushed against that and labeled these guys being a bunch of weirdo wackos but in reality william jennings bryant had a great quote that i want to read to you as he found himself ushered into the democratic party as as the possible candidate because the democrat uh, Canada at the time was really weak compared to Republican McKinley. Here was what he said in a famous cross of gold speech. I'll read parts of it to you. He says, You shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. He's arguing here that it's the wealthy industrialists that are putting upon the, the farmer, the one that supports everything American. Uh, in it based on you know that that picture that I showed you a few slides before again the farmer is the one that is the center centerpiece to everything going on it is this gold cross that is basically keeping the farmer from um, making sure that they have well what emerges is this interesting third political party you have the Republicans um, and, and McKinley you have the Democrats and their lame duck present um, draw, drawing blank Hannah, but then you have this third party beginning to emerge that is called the populists. And it is there that they began supporting this thing called a graduated income tax. So basically, if you make this much, you pay this. If you have make a little more, you pay that. If you pay that, you know, make this. And if you're at the top of the scale, you pay even more. We do this now. But back then, this was a very radical idea. They argued for eight hour workday. Hmm, imagine that. They argued for restriction of immigration. Uh, that's some of the prejudice going on. And they argued for the right for women to, to vote. This mindset had quite a few voters uh, and followers of it to where you began to recognize that soon this populist platform is very strong and, and begins to kind of have a sway over the politics during this time. It is during this time as well we begin seeing the president Grover Cleveland at the time, and this is just before the, the, the you know another uh, stock market crash of 1893. <coughs> you see this this depression is causing millions of men and, and and women to be unemployed, and so Jacob Cox, the interesting, he's uh, a populist, uh, a wealthy man himself. I believe he owned some sort of. Uh, uh, what do you call it, like a mining operation in West Virginia. He loaded up in a, a, a coxie buggy, his wife and his young child, and pretty soon he hired people to come and join him and they led a march and soon thousands upon thousands of men were there to basically say, we need president a, a government works program to provide jobs for the unemployed. A brilliant strategy. Uh, what was responded? Well, Coxie and his men were arrested by the government for trespassing on the grass of the White House lawn. That kind of brought an end to this here. And and what does this this do? Um, well, to help pay to get America out of this depression, um, you, you see President Grover Cleveland doing something that helped the industrialists, but it certainly hurt the farmers. He in, raises tariffs again, which helps the industrialists, but it certainly hurts the farmers. Um, during this time. And finally, I want to break out into this, this map here. And, and, and this is probably outside of the election of Lincoln. This election of 1896 um, is a very important one because you can see how America is divided between the industrialists on the East Coast and those around Chicago and a little bit of those out in California and the rest of the South and the Midwest. Okay. And, and America is divided uh, based on these things. Um, and, and we begin recognizing this is a South versus a North thing. This is a slave versus a, a free thing. This is industrial versus the rural. This is, or you guys with me on this, there, there's a lot going on that America um, is gonna begin having to unpack as we begin marching into time period seven and, and uh, the eve of uh, the Spanish-American War 
uh, etc. Okay, and so with that, I, I just want to recognize that this, the, the populist movement uh, had tremendous sway. And if you've been paying attention to local politics of 2020, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders, uh, uh, AOC, Ocasio-Cortez, she, she is, um, they're big advocates of this movement of uh, workers' rights and um, uh, distributing the wealth uh, more so than what is right now. And the government's job is to protect those of, of the those who can't defend themselves, etc. And so uh, this is a platform that is nothing new. You can go back to the populist party and find some of the same language that was then just they are using now. And so I would encourage you if there are some aspects of libertarianism that you enjoy or even a, uh, I want to call it a very a liberal stance to the Democrat party, uh, the populist movement probably resonates with you. Um, do that. So what, what caused the failure of the populist movement if it had so many strengths during its time? Well, um, it was torn apart by internal divisions and regional interests. And, and also is that they didn't often um, seek out the, the voice of those working in the factories on, in, in the East Coast. And, and, and lastly is the African American vote were further disenfranchised as evidence of this picture here that I'll talk about during my Steger Select. So in short, there was a um, failure, four steps of failure of the populist party that you, know, you can kind of highlight. And, and you know, one of them is their inability to um, nail down the 16 to one ratios. The second thing that you can talk about is, is uh, uh, it was more regional. A third thing is, is that the African-American um, was disenfranchised. And, and, and the fourth thing, that you can raise, they never sought out guidance or help from those uh, working in the factories. That would have been millions more. Had that been the case, I'm sure America would have a third party that would rival the Democrat or Republican during this time. And so in short, we need to recognize that with various depressions, the government still is not able to meet the needs of the people. We have the farmers and the poor facing these challenges and, and um, this this ineptitude of our government will continue for the next 30 years, um, well into um, getting into the FDR uh, time period. So with that, keep a classy uh, Golden Bears and have a good uh, rest of your day.